that's the best thing any kind of system can do. Yeah. As you're learning on your own? Uh, this was cool. Um, cool moments. So. But off campus? Off campus. Um, and you can actually place the window as well as for our class. So it's going to take you guys to go. So you can have a problem. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thanks for coming. So, uh, Martin has set a high bar for introductions this term. Um, so, I mean, so Scott's from Australia. I can't ask you to name the neighbors in Australia, but um, I could. But uh, Martin suggested a different different quiz, which is that I ask people to name six marsupials. So, <laughs> kangaroo, wallaby, opossum, opossum, Tasmanian uh, devil. Is the Tasmanian tiger one as well? I think it is one too. Yeah, yeah, well, it's not a that they exist anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, but the beavers like count. Like OSU? <laughs> How was it? In the past. Oh, the oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, so, uh, okay. it's actually kind of arguable where the tigers is actually my super role. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're monitoring them. They, they lay eggs, not like young. So, uh, okay. they're pretty they, distant they they carry them around. And then they carry them in the yeah. Okay, great. Well, you, you passed. <laughs> <laughs> so, Scott Morrison. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, great introduction. Um, so the, the the point of the talk today is to tell you about some uh, invariant sort of smooth four manifolds that we now know how to build using uh, something called Kohana homology. Uh, fortunately, for the purposes of today, you don't need to know anything about what Kohana homology is, and will essentially be able to treat it as a black box. Uh, it's some not invariant, but uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what sort of black box it is, and then how we could use that to, to build invariant four manifolds. So the, the outline is roughly so you get these invariants. Old-fashioned black box Kibana homology, this arrow that you think of the client with. Uh, so what sort of gadget is it? Well, you stick in here a four manifold W and get a, uh, a vector space. So it's a, a vector space value for the four manifolds. And in fact, we're going to do some extra gradings on this vector space, but we will not, not worry about those until uh, we get there. Smooth four manifold. And in fact, there's a relative version of this invariant we're going to define today as well, which is that you can think here about having a link, uh, possibly, with a link L in its boundary. So it's, it's possibly some three manifold boundary, or it could be empty if you like. We'll add to draw a link. That's there, and we can just 
to the extension of the usual Cartesian relation. Namely, if you stick in the standard form that's linked in that p square boundary, then you get what you expect. You expect the space is just the usual diagraded vector space that your bottom homology tells you uh, to associate with your vector. Okay. So before I talk very much about what Corona homology is and how we use it to produce something like this, let me just give a little bit of um, the, the context of why on earth we might want more four manifold invariants or four manifold invariants at all, and why one built out of Corona homology might be something interesting to, uh, to look at. And the, 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 the big scary answer to this question uh, is, of course, the smooth four dimensional quadrate conjecture. Sort of the, the last man standing in uh, this sort of old fashioned geometric topology, uh, smooth concrete conjecture in 4D, which just says that if you're homeomorphic to the standard four square, you're diffeomorphic to. So, opinions certainly vary as to the likely truth of, of this last, last piece of the concrete conjecture. And opinions vary because there are a lot of potential counterexamples out there. Or, or maybe, maybe as time goes by, there are actually decreasingly many, but uh, there are certainly many things that people have proposed that are obviously homeomorphic to S4, but it's, it's very unclear whether they have the same or same structure. And this is sort of a, a sad situation because for many years, we, these example, particular kind of examples have been out there. We just haven't had any tools to detect, uh, well, to, to detect the differences from the standard S4. And very, very roughly, I mean, this is not the content of the, the talk, but uh, the idea is just that uh, gauge theory, which, is, which essentially, via Steiger Gruden theory and Donaldson theory and all that stuff, which essentially provides all of the tools we have to to produce invariants of, of these things, uh, gauge theory doesn't see smooth structure near a point. So, so otherwise, maybe you need some, some second homology in a manifold for gauge theory to see anything too much for you. Well, so the, the, the hope then is that we can do something instead of Kravana homology. I mean, I mean, you shouldn't get me wrong here. I'm, I'm uh, I'm not going to say anything about this, but at the end of today, um, don't anticipate anything. Um, but the, the the motivation for all of these constructions that I want to talk about are really to get new invariants that sort of that aren't affected by this uh, this problem. So what can we say about Kravana homology? Well, it really sort of does depend on smooth structures, and, but at the very least, you could say that you need smooth structures around to talk about. Homology. It's at least not obviously weaker than anything from gauge theory, although it does have certain very close connections that are still being worked out. And uh, maybe one day people will have a, uh, a sensible way of saying that this objection to gauge theory also, also applies to, to Corona homology. <coughs> and so let's, let's say that maybe. So before getting into uh, the business of actually defining those vector spaces that I, that I want to propose later, I just want to give a little bit more history on the interaction between this problem and, and, uh, and Corona homology, which is uh, that a few years ago, uh, well, sorry, I should say somewhere back in the title. Chris Douglas, who's at Oxford, and Kevin Walker, who's at Microsoft. And with Kevin Walker, 
Walker and a few other people, such as uh, Friedman and so on. Walker. We, pr we proposed a, a, a way to, to detect some of these counterexamples um, using Kamara homology, but by a sort of more simple minded thing than, than what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the course. So, uh, what did we do? Yeah, the idea is roughly this. So each, each whole Shannison sphere, uh, it doesn't really matter what these are, but they're you know, amongst the counterexamples that have been sitting out there for a while, amongst the potential counterexamples, uh, gives us a link. With a slice that is bound to smooth this. some exotic form, some particularly exotic uh, S4 minus form. Okay, <laughs> so that's great. We've got all these links, which must, which we know must be slice out in some ball that we can build out of the sphere. But what does Kermano homology tell us? From Kermano homology, uh, we define this thing, well, we don't, but Shapeless Muslim and some other people might build it, define the S invariant. Which is a lower bound than the slice genus. The slice genus is just the, uh, the minimal genus of a, of a surface in the four-ball uh, bounding, uh, bounding the link. But of course, uh, slice links are exactly the ones where the slice genus is, is zero. Okay. So straight away you have if S of one of these links coming from the control Janison sphere is positive, that control Janison sphere is exotic. Okay? The, the was sliced over here, it can't have been sliced in the standard ball, and therefore that ball in the standard ball is empty. Okay? So, well, that was a that was a nice idea, but of course, we failed. And, uh, and recently, uh, Kronheimer and Boxkin proved that we were doomed. In a sense, in the sense that they could show that if you have some link in the three sphere which is slicing any homotopy ball, then actually its S invariant is zero. And they did this by interpreting uh, this S invariant in here. And then essentially following this idea that the theory can't see things very Okay. So the whole point of, of that, uh, that sad story, this idea and, and, its, and its demise, is that there's much more information. In the Kravana homology of a link, than just the S invariant and the whole plan of today is instead of just following this very indirect route producing something out of the manifold computing just this tiny piece of Kermana homology S and hoping to do something with that we're going to try and use all of the information of, of Kermana homology to, to, uh, to construct some So that's all this little, little bit of background of where we're, where we're coming from and how to, to define this. So the, the general story that we really had in the back of our mind when, de when defining all of this is that uh, using Kumara homology, we can build something called a poor category, a particular type of poor category. Now, it doesn't really matter what a poor category is for the purposes of today, because I'm going to describe this, this whole thing much more explicitly. But the general idea is that from Kravana homology, you hope to be able to construct some four category and then follow a very general recipe that, that takes n categories and produces invariants of 
in that place. But instead of trying to talk about that very general recipe, we're getting bogged down in the language of higher categories. I'm going to show you a very explicit construction of the do-based combined form. But secretly in the back of my mind, I know about topological quantum field theory, where we're following the recipe of topological quantum field theory. That's the story. So let's jump in, and, uh, and uh, I'll show you how to build a certain class of four manifold invariants, and then I'm going to show you, uh, well, and, and, and this class of four manifold invariants will require uh, some certain sort of algebraic input. And I'm going to show you how combined homology provides that sort of algebraic input. Okay, so what I'm going to do is define a thing called a lasagna algebra. And uh, I'll apologize for the name, and maybe explain it in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment. But let's, uh, let's just get the idea first. So first of all, I need a lasagna diagram. Lasagna diagram consists of the, the following the following data. Um, so, so uh, some four wall, four G naught, some disjoint four walls Bi uh, in the interior of, of, of the big wall B naught. The surface sigma sitting inside the complementary region. So you know what take away the union of the eyes. Okay. So oh and, and moreover, this surface should meet all of these boundaries, the boundary of the outer wall and the boundary of the inner wall. So if it does meet them transversely. So let's uh, let's just draw a picture of what that looks like. Here's how our big four wall. Inside of that, there are some cutout four walls. And then there's some surface. So this is B0 in 1 and B2. Maybe it's obvious to this dimension is pushed down a little bit. This is a surface in four space here. But then on the boundaries, you see uh, well, what happens, sorry, what happens when a when a surface and a four wall transversely meet some three manifold, you see some, some link in that boundary. Okay, so here, so we've got some, some links which are at the intersection of that surface. Let's see, I'm not really an apologist because I can't draw it like that. That's a fair point, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Very good. So let's just give these things names. Uh, so the surface will be sigma, and I'll call the link in the boundary of a ball B I L. Okay, so here are some cabinets called lasagna diagrams, and the basic idea is that a lasagna algebra is uh, an algebraic gadget whose operations are indexed by these lasagna diagrams. So if you know and love the language of operads. Show you how to think of these, these diagrams as an operand, a lasagna algebra is an algebra over that operand. But just more explicitly, we've got this the lasagna algebra that can be called A consists of for each link in a three sphere. Vector space so here I'm thinking uh, this needn't be the standard three sphere just any manifold that, that is, is deeply amorphous to, to, a, to a three sphere so that's, that's some huge collection of vector spaces for every embedded link in every sphere I want to return me a vector space and a linear map Lasagna diagram, which I'll just sort of I'll, I'll use notation and, and abbreviate all that data into just a sigma here to hold the, the surface. So for each lasagna diagram and map, A of sigma, which maps you from the tensor product of the vector spaces 
associated to the links on the intervals to the vector space associated with the link to the z number of the arguments below. Okay, so that's all of the, the data of the lasagna algebra. So after that, just the two axioms hold. Isotopic surfaces, rel boundaries. So here I'm thinking about two lasagna diagrams where I'm fixing the, the particular embedded link on all the boundaries and just moving the surface around in the interior region. Isotopic surfaces, rel boundaries, give the same map. So it's some sense only that it's wiggling on the surface. And compositions. Lasagna diagrams give uh, sort of composite maps. Let's spell that, uh, that out a little bit. If, uh, say, I've got this lasagna diagram right here, and you've got another lasagna diagram whose outer link is a hop link, I can just paste that into this ball here and use another lasagna, lasagna diagram. Anyway. Each of those correspond to some linear map. The linear map of the composite one should just be given by the linear map of the first one stuck into the corresponding factor of the linear map. So you might imagine that this is the result. Okay. This is the dimensions collapsed down a whole lot. You might imagine plugging those little tiny diagrams into, into this guy. Okay, so why is this called a lasagna diagram? Well, uh, somewhat ridiculously, maybe sufficiently ridiculously that I won't write it on the blackboard, uh, is that I would call this the, uh, the n equals 4, k equals 2 case of an nk pasta algebra. Uh, so the, the, the origin of this is actually two dimensions down, where um, this bit over here, there's this notion of a planar algebra. So planar algebra, so this was a notion originally introduced by Von Jones studying subfactors on Norman algebras, but it's, it's more useful than just that. So a planar algebra associates a vector space to each circle with some marked points on it. Map. Each diagram is in something like this. So I've got a, this is now a literal picture, unlike the ones here where you had to imagine one image another. Here's just, just some two disks, two disks cut out. And uh, some one manifold in the, in the, in the complement. And uh, Vaughan has always called these pictures spaghetti and meatball <coughs> diagrams. There's the spaghetti, there's the meatballs. And so when we go up to this case, we're looking at two-dimension two stuff in four space. Uh, the surface is obviously the lasagna. That's one way of saying it. Okay. And of course, you, and then you can see maybe the, the, the general n comma k case that you could ever find in, in the list for that. Um, okay. So this is this is what I mean by a lasagna algebra. And it maybe looks like a uh, somewhat ridiculous gadget. You need to specify a lot of data here to, to give me one. But the point is that if you've got one of these lasagna algebras, there's a completely trivial thing that you can do to build an invariant of four manifolds. And that completely trivial thing is what we're going to do today. So let me show it to you. Lasagna algebra on the right under arrow, and here we've got four manifolds and a 
link in the boundary. But what is this? This is some vector space. And I'm going to describe it to you as a span. Maybe let's expand some diagrams. Um, I'm going to describe it first as, as, as span by some ridiculous collection of, of things, and then I'm going to take a very a giant quotient of, of, uh, of whatever I can get. So what do we put here? We put lasagna <coughs> diagrams in W. Okay, so here's a picture of W. It's no longer a four ball over there, it's got some topology. And uh, maybe we draw in the link. Let's say the link is just uh, something sitting on the boundary like that. Well, a lasagna diagram means that you can cut out some balls on the inside, even though the, uh, the outside thing can be any format of object, you cut out just four balls inside. And you take some surface in the complement again. It meets the inner balls and links. And meets the, the outer boundary of the manifold in the specified length element. And moreover, you, uh, you, you have to give labels on the inner balls, where here, so this is, uh, this is the link Li. X is an element of the vector space in lasagna algebra A associated to that link L i. Okay? So so far, you could think of this, this thing we've produced so far as this gigantic direct sum over all the possible pictures, that is, choices of embedded balls and a surface on the inside. And in each direct sum end is just the tensor product of the vector spaces that the lasagna algebra associates to. And you can take out yeah, as many balls as you want. And you can here. Okay. So what is the relation? The relation is something fairly simple, which is just that suppose inside one of these big pictures, I uh, I look inside some region that's shaped like a ball that um, that, that sort of properly nested with the, the actual ball. That is that it, strictly contains or strictly constrained to some middle. So say inside that picture, I see this configuration. So I, what you, I want you to imagine this intersect of this picture with some ball sitting on the inside. Maybe that's the left picture. Well, then I, I take that entire lasagna diagram on W with labels. And just declare that that's equal to the lasagna, di sorry, the lasagna diagram I get by cutting out everything inside that ball and replacing it with a single big ball that's labeled by, uh, let me give the surface I see here a name, which is a sigma prime, that's just the intersection of this surface with some smaller embedded ball. I replace that whole picture with a single ball labeled by whatever I get by taking the lasagna algebra map for that sigma and applying it to x and y. Okay? So this is saying that you can, you can always replace subpieces of this picture with, with single balls labeled by the thing that the lasagna algebra gives you acting on the original labels on the smaller balls that you can see. Okay. Um, this is a bit of a confusing definition. Um, so aren't happy with it or don't understand what's going on, you can say so. <laughs> Complaining. Um, um, yeah, there, there, there are actually some, um, some nice ways you can, you can think about this in terms of tensor products over, over objects. Yeah, there's this thing. Um, yeah, sorry, I, um, Yeah, yeah, so it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very similar to something you might imagine doing with a, an EN algebra, but there you wouldn't see any of the surface. There would just be some empty space outside of the balls that you would be in that. But yeah, it's very much. Um, uh, so since, since uh, you, you obviously know what an EN algebra is, you can think of an EN algebra as being like a, an N category where there are no morphisms except the level N. And 
and we're just following along here. All the rest of it is you know E and out because it says now we've got some morphisms of this two and three as well, which is sort of like just represented by circles. Uh, so maybe an another thing to say about this definition, which may help some people, but might not help other people, uh, is to explain the reason for this arrow we write in the notation. You can imagine taking this huge diagram uh, where the, the vertices in the diagram are the unlabeled versions of the strictures, okay? Just, um, just embedded balls and surfaces, surfaces between them. And then there are arrows in this diagram um, connecting up one picture with, uh, with, the, with another picture where you sort of you roll put some stuff in a ball, okay? So a lasagna algebra gives you a vector space to point in that diagram the tensor product of the vector spaces for the embedded balls, and gives you a map, the arrow in that diagram, the, the map associated to what you saw in the resulting ball. And so this, this, definition, here, this definition here, this quotient, is just a coma of, of the, the map that A is giving you on, on that diagram. Some people might prefer that. Okay. So, uh, what do we need to do next? find some source of lasagna algebras and quarter regions, and uh, the rest of the talk is essentially dedicated to showing that Provano homology provides one of these examples. So, let's start from that over here. So to, to do this, I'm going to have to say a little bit now about what Provano homology is. And uh, I'll, I'll avoid actually doing the definition, um, but we're going to have to look a little bit, a little bit deeper. So, what is Kavanaugh? Uh, so, what we need from it? Well. Maybe, yeah, maybe we say a little bit more about it. So uh, it's defined combinatorially. What does it do? Well, for each link diagram, that is not an actual embedded link somewhere, but just a, a picture of one, it produces some chain function. And acting on link diagrams, we can think of Morse and random massive groups. So random massive groups are just things like turning this piece of a link diagram into that piece of a link diagram, and Morse groups are things like uh, saddles or, or pops and caps that fill or, or create circles. Those are some operations on link diagrams, and Kavano homology sends those to chain maps between the corresponding chain complexes. And then there's one more level of structure here, which is the Twitch movie move. Uh, so, what's a movie move? Well, uh, given some sequence of Morse and random master moves, that represents some surface. Moving our, moving our link around, okay? But it's possible that you can write the same surface using two different sequences of Morse and Radomeister moves, and the movie moves exactly capture that. Two sequences of Morse and Radomeister moves <coughs> represent the same, the same Fibortism of links exactly as they're related by sequence of movie moves. So uh, an example is maybe Here's a little sequence of, uh, of things happening. Uh, at the beginning, we just have some little tangle, two strings crossing each other. We do a random master of one move here. Then we start moving this back strand over. This is a random master of three moves. And then finally, we, uh, we unclink that strand. And a movie move says that this whole thing here is actually just here. Okay? So that's the sort of thing that you have in mind for movie moves. What does that 
send or could run a command and be sent to, to, uh, to a bunch of patterns. Actually, it's a little bit briefer than that. Really, all it does is guarantees that two sequences which are related by moving moves are on the top of it. doesn't explicitly handle it. But, uh, okay. But then you can just take a molecule of this object. Find on this sort of combinatorial version of, of the theory of links, but um, because you, but when you have this, well, having this extra layer of structure, knowing that um, knowing that, I, that, that the equivalent sequences of Morse and random isomers really give identical linear maps, means that we can really think of this, even though we started with an entirely combinatorial definition. saying that yeah, links with the generic um, projection, uh, including up into the, uh, and, and generic divorces between them, including into the category of arbitrary links is an equivalence of patterns and that sort of thing. Think of it like that, even though it's defined combinatorial, you can really think of it as giving a particular vector space for each particular embedded link, and particular isomorphisms between those vector spaces for each isotopy. Uh, that's what, so that's sort of the, this is the black box content. But we need more. And the more that we need is something for uh, links in S3, not links in D3. We, we need a uh, lasagna algorithm needs, needs a vector space for link in S3. And there's, there's actually really a gap here and something new that we need to learn about from other homology before we can Similarly, maps for for cohortisms in S3 plus R. So let me show you um, what looks at first like a sort of daft way to, to take what we've got here and produce something for vector spaces for, for, for links in, in S3. But, but when we think for a moment about the, the daft thing I propose doing, you'll see that we need to actually check something about the bunch of And uh, then we'll, we'll talk about that. So, Here's a, here's a definition. So I'm going to define the Kibana homology <laughs> in a three sphere as the flat sections of a certain vector bundle. So what is this? Well, the base space of this vector bundle is going to be the three sphere minus the length, just the, the complement. Okay? And the fiber over each point x is the Kibana homology of that link sitting inside uh, the sphere, take away the point of the sphere. Okay? So 
So this gives us some vector space sitting over each point in the space time. Okay? Now, if I'm going to say flat sections, I need to tell you uh, a, a parallel transfer on, on this one. So with parallel transfer along some path gamma sitting inside of the complement, well, what can I do? What I can do is take the link cross I and think of that as some surface sitting inside the sphere cross I take away the, the graph of that, of that path gamma. Okay? This here, so, so here I'm thinking this path, path gamma is going from some particular point in the space space to some other point. I need to tell you the isomorphism between the fibers. Well, what have we got here? We've got some surface in something that looks like a B3 cross I. Okay, so in particular, that gives us a map from one fiber to the other, and since the surface is, is a cylinder, it gives us an isomorphism between the fibers. Okay. That seems a, well, to me this always looks like a, a kind of going to unnecessary effort somehow Surely we could have got by just thinking it'd be free. But we're, we'll, we'll see in a second that there's something going on here. And the something <coughs> is checking that there are any flat sections at all with respect to the field. It's not clear that this parallel transfer that we find really has non-trivial monotonies. Okay, so let's let's think about what happens. The monotony. Around the meridian of the link, so some little circle wrapping around some strand. What does this surface end up looking like? Well, what it is, is it's the Kerbano homology, well, the, the, the map the Kerbano homology associates to the following, uh, the following picture. We start with a link looking like this, so here T represents just some tangle with two boundary points and some arc coming out of the right hand side. Now I'm going to show you some isotopy of, 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 this, of this knot. And what I'm going to do is swing this, this string all the way around the outside. So uh, I'll go right at my sort of one move there, which is a little pink. And then I'll, uh, so here I'm doing some long sequence of randomized for two and three moves. This is swinging past and behind the T. Then I'll do another little randomized for one move to get it back out. And then I guess I pull the string behind T there, so I better take it over the top. Now, uh, okay. So that's some. This thing here is just some map from the Kerbano homology of this link to itself, and I claim that that map is what we're defining as the, the monodromy of the of a, of a little meridian around the link. And the point is just that it's not at all obvious that this map, which is some long composition of randomized moves, could be the edit. Okay? So, well, uh, maybe somewhat anticlimactically, it is the identity, but uh, that's essentially um, what it did to, to make this whole business that I'm talking about today work. So that tells us that we did something sensible here. There really were flat sections here. Uh, so we've got at least some definition of the homology of a link in a, in a sphere. So um, let me not say anything about the proof of this theorem. It's, it's essentially not very exciting. Uh, and, uh, and it requires very in-depth description. Homology associates to all the random ice two and three maps, and, and uh, I don't think there's anything to say about it. So, we've got that far. Uh, we've, we've produced the vector space part of a lasagna algebra, and I now need to tell you how lasagna diagrams work. How, how lasagna diagrams work. So, uh, let me give myself a bit more space. How do lasagna diagrams act on these vector spaces? Well, 
maybe one thing that I should say, going, uh, going back to that definition of the Kabbalah homology for a linear sphere, is that since we defined it just by flat sections of some bundle, the, the, uh, the map from here that just evaluates this section at some point is, is an isomorphism. Okay? So this vector space is, is nothing more or less than the vector spaces over each point. And we're going to use that to define the action of lasagna diagrams. So let's uh, have a simple picture in mind while we do this. Choose arcs cannot uh, in the complement of the signal that connect some point on each of the inner walls to some chosen point on the outer wall. Okay? Let's call this guy x north. Some of these guys can be called x1 and x2. We can certainly do this this photometry 2, this photometry 1, there's plenty of room to, to make that choice. And now, in the complement of those arcs, we have what we call the opposite. In the complement of gamma, we have a cavorism. Gamma. And that cobordism, just using the, 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 the black box piece of Kavana homology, gives us some linear map from the Kavana homologies of the LIs, thought of as sitting in the, the spheres minus the, minus the points, to the Kavana homology of the outer link, thought as being in this ball, the sphere minus the point. This map is independent of the choice of gamma. Now, we, we checked a moment ago that just by counting dimensions, uh, there, there, there's no problem choosing gamma. But the space of choices of gamma are connected. That is, if I'm you know, moving these arcs around in some other configuration, just coming from, from sigma, I might have to pass through sigma at some point. Okay? But checking that this map that we get is independent of the choice of gamma is exactly that last theorem. And now, uh, because the, um, the, the map evaluating this flat section at a point was an isomorphism, when we got this map defined on some evaluations of points, whatever these base points gamma were, we would get a map between the actual vector spaces. So there's a little bit of formal nonsense you need to do to boost up Kavana homology as usual, usually put up in the, in the ball, up to this lasagna algebra level. But everything you need to check as you go along comes down to this peculiar fact about Kavana homology, um, the capillary we prove it. Um, although maybe I might add that the way that we prove it um, is very specific to um, the way that we understand, for anyone who knows Kavana homology, so the way that we prove it is very specific to um, uh, uh, so, so sort of the, the, the original version of Kravana. Right now, there are lots of other versions of Kravana homology associated with other groups and other representations, yada, yada, yada. And we have no idea how you would run an argument like this in any other case. We would be able to do sort of some details that would be in the simplest possible version of Kravana. But I think we should expect it. Okay. So, well, what have we done so far? We've defined the lasagna algebra, shown how to produce four manifold invariants from them, and shown that Kravana homology produces a lasagna algebra and hence four manifold invariants. What on earth can you say about these things? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is 
not a whole lot. It turns out to be quite difficult to do computations in this environment. So let me just uh, uh, summarize what we, what we do. So computations. Oh, m maybe something I, I should have said uh, about this construction of manifold invariance from Lasagna algebra. If you know um, about topological quantum field theories, then all the examples you know about, like Turayev bureau theory and rhythm metric and Turayev theory and so on, can all be put in a framework very, very much like the, the one that I gave for the computers. I'm not really doing anything that different from what people are doing. Oh, so these are a few very simple things we can say. say the, the two things that we, the two tricks we have at our sleep to do computations in the same group and, and what, we can, uh, what we can get out of them. So the TQFT framework uh, tells us how to associate, well, so far we've produced vector spaces for four manifolds, but with a tiny bit more work, very, very little more work. You can associate one category to each three manifold. In fact, if you like these things, you can go all the way down and associate k categories to four minus k manifolds. So let's just go one level first. Now, if uh, W, so if we have M, some three manifold, sitting inside the boundary of some four manifold. This vector space for W becomes a module over this category associated with that boundary, that, that three manifold we see sitting here. Now, if we actually see two copies of M sitting inside the boundary, then, uh, then you actually see that vector space becoming a final module. And then the theorem there here is that you can compute. And this has got nothing to do with Kavanaugh homology. This is something that's true for anything defined in this fashion. But the vector space you get for W uh, glued to itself. Sorry, that's unconventional notation. I mean, just identify the two copies of M in the boundary. This thing is given by taking this bimodule for W taking the tensor product of itself that is identified the, the left and right actions of this category associated with the boundary of this. Now, this, is, this theorem is all well and good, but unless you can very explicitly analyze this bimodule, analyze this category and this bimodule structure, it doesn't tell you very much because you need to have a very explicit description of everything involved to compute this tensor product. And there's sort of one case where we can do anything. Writing down these actions uh, for, uh, for the following. So the next simplest manifold, maybe after these guys, the next simplest four manifolds, we take B3 cross S1. So I'm thinking of it in this set as taking a copy of B4 with two copies of B3 sitting in the boundary, just moving those two B3s together. For B3 cross S1 um, with a few tangles in the boundary. Either 
crossing, or two arcs just continuing around, or, or this final tangle ends up just being the unknown sitting in the boundary of this process. And so you get answers here, and yes, the answer here is infinitely dimensional, unlike the papers we're getting back here, but there are some gradients on this vector space which I've omitted all the way along. So the answer that you get here is that you find the Oh yes, yeah, they're definitely different. And uh, something that you can say about the, the way in which they're different, it's sort of interesting for the, the next point, is that uh, even before that is sort of classical Kuban homology, uh, there's an exact triangle which is relating to Kuban homology of some link where inside you see some crossing somewhere, and the Kuban homology where you look at the two, the two different resolutions of that cross. Okay? This is like some fancy version of the identity of the Jones triangle set that's relating the lengths of those vector spaces. And the whole point of doing this calculation here in B3 plus X1 with these three different angles is that we observe that this fails uh, in B3 plus X1. That is assuming that these tentative answers are right. And that's not so, so surprising. Uh, remember that the definition of this gadget is, um, is this by this huge quotient construction. And there's just no reason to expect that exactness that you see sort of locally on balls will survive when you look at this quotient. So that's unsurprising maybe that this fails, but it's also very disappointing um, because this was the main tool for doing computations back in before. Uh, so there's one more thing that we, we hope to do in terms of calculations. Um, this is getting a bit ambitious now. There's a derived version of this whole construction. Uh, replacing the quotient by some resolution. That is, when I define that, that quotient for the beginning of the vector space for four manifold. Now we've got some crazy chain complex supported in positive degrees. The zero homology of this vector space I've defined, maybe this highest vector. And the point is that this fancy version is still exact, and so you get the following uh, crazy setup. So let's um, let's unwrap this exact triangle and draw it. Uh, As you go along here, there's going to be some, uh, some shift in this internal grading, which I haven't been talking about at all as you go along here. But the point now is that I can think about um, what I'm thinking, I want to think now, it's, uh, instead of this invariant, the KH under arrow, I'm thinking now about the zero graded piece of this chain complex solution. I'm going to draw in all the higher pieces as well. Just that if you compute the, the homology of this bike complex by computing the horizontal differential first, you just get zero because each row actually has this exactness property that you had back in before, even though you're working on some other manifold in this picture. But if you compute uh, the, 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 the homology of this bike complex by computing the vertical one first, then what you see is this invariant I've been defining, k under arrow, sitting along the, the bottom. You can think this thing gives you some spectral sequence which abuts to zero because that's from the horizontal differentials. So this first term has this bottom row of this thing you're trying to calculate. And we're now trying to use this spectral sequence to do some computations with these guys, assuming we have the answers for the, for the result nuts. And that's still a work in progress. We don't have any particular case before we have an answer coming from that row. This is something that this will eventually tell us something.
Yeah, so you can certainly, um, uh, yeah, and so, so a nice thing to say in that direction is that you can think about the, um, the, um, the, the second homology of the manifold with Z2 coefficients. You can actually get um, from a sort of degeneration of, of the Kavana homology vector. And, and because of that, there's actually a whole extra grading on these, on these invariants uh, where you can graded by the second homology, the Z2 coefficients of the, of the manifold. And remember right back at the beginning I said something about Kavana homology with the slice fields. We respect that these formulas and we can also give bounds for the genus of, of, of classes in specific dimensions. Oh, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, that, that So here's a, here's a baby version. Uh, the vector space that you associate to a, to a ball is just um, the um, unoriented surfaces in, in the, in the four ball bounding that particular length um, uh, up, to, up, up to circles. So you're allowed to just take any two GTC parallel or two GTC. And the, the vector space invariant that you get out from, from, from that lasagna algebra um, will compute the second homology. But that's just the second homology that you're asking me to do. Okay. Thanks. Gary. Yeah. Um, Yeah, 
And even I put that in the notes, you know. Like, yeah, like, this person looks really good. It's just not clear that they're a mathematician. Yeah. So, I think what I have trouble with is what to do with a more senior. Yeah. I have had a couple yeah. of issues there, too. So yeah. Someone who has you know, recently got senior. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I mean, conceivably, that's something that you can look at. It's the size of the actual Or even if we have the ability. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think then the corresponding thing to, to that sort of question is um, is looking for obstructions for E4 algebra for math and being E5 algebra. Well, that's right. That is and that, that's, I mean, that's exactly the same rules, for instance. And here, so here maybe the corresponding thing is um, so we've got some, uh, I don't want to think of Kavanaugh from all over here as a twice boring four category. Bottom two levels are, are boring. And so you might ask, um, well, can I actually just push it up a level, maybe arbitrarily many levels? And it's actually very easy to see that's not the case here, because that one, as soon as you did that, um, the, the sort of the grading structure in Kavanaugh can actually be turned into a, a symmetry structure. You just lose all the information about the process. And another way of saying that is just that um, surfaces um, in, in higher than four dimensions. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll take you over. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so I think that's sort of, from that point of view, um, this is a very principal four dimension that you can find. Well, whenever somebody tells me what an operator is, I always want to know, among other things, what are the, um, what are the algebras? And I guess you told me that, but I don't really feel like I understood it. 